and welcome to the second season, would you believe it, we're back for a second season of the Working People podcast, which, drumroll, we've now redubbed Mums, Dads and, well no, Mums, Dads work. There's no and. We're not so pathetic and sad to have an and. We're mum's dad's work. Full stops between yeah, full you stops as well. in between, that's it. <laughs> uh, my, name, my name's Ben Falk. I'm the editor of Working Dads. I'm here with Mandy Garner, editor of Working Mums and Working Wives. Hi, Mandy. Hi, Ben. Good to see you um, again. <laughs> yeah, good to see you too. It's been ages. But yes, yeah, so we're, we're really excited. We're back with a new slew of podcast episodes. And we've done things a little bit differently. We've kind of taken on board some of the feedback from, from people who read the sites and some of the people we chat to. And so what we're going to do is actually alongside just me and Mandy talking a little bit about what's going on in the world of work and working parents. We're also going to be chatting to some really brilliant experts who can give you top advice about particular particular things. So Mandy, tell us about some of the things that we're going to be chatting about over the, the next sort of six episodes. Right, yes. So we've got uh, experts in lots of different areas and the aim is to give you kind of really practical advice. So that includes anything from career transition, obviously CVs and, and, and interviews, flexible working, how to find flexible, how to negotiate flexible working, all of that kind of thing. So hopefully it will all be really useful. Yeah, perfect. So we're going to keep you up to date with the things that are going on for working parents and then some really kind of hardcore practical advice on some of the things that challenges, I guess, and the kind of things you might be questioning about how to do things, how to do things well. So we're really excited about that. But for this first episode, I think one of the things we need to say, trumpet from the rooftops, is it is return to work week at WM People. Mandy, what, just tell people a little bit about what return to work week is. Yes, it's very exciting. It's our first one ever. <laughs> it kind of brings <laughs> yeah, you. <enormous>. <laughs> <laughs> after many many years of doing lots of different things on an individual basis we brought them all together in one week for a kind of bumper approach so it's it, again it's very much practically pr focused on on giving advice and help and support so it's got all sorts of things it covers again cv writing interviews the latest information in what you should do how to negotiate ats systems and using keywords and all that kind of thing also self-employment self-employment opportunities how to transition into technology maybe get a higher paid job maybe we all need a bit <laughs> we all need that these days finishing off with flexible friday i think it is i think there's something every day there's there's usually several things every day and i know i'm doing about three of them three of the okay. web webinars so <laughs> yeah, they're fun. all over on you can find them you know there's there's information about those all over the sites there's information about all over all over the our socials and stuff like that so please do check out this yeah there's webinars there's guides there's a whole kit and caboodle isn't there it's, it's a it's a big enterprise there is and then there's also signposting to you know jobs flexible jobs that are available top employers that kind of thing so all very very much you know stuff that you you need and all gathered in one place excellent so we're going to well we wanted to tell you about that but then obviously as we said we've, we've done these interviews so so mandy do you want to give us a little kind of breakdown of our first guest which is yeah a really great one Yes, so the first, our first guest is Emma Alkirwi, who is the CV guru. Uh, we've been working with Emma for many, many years, and she does regular columns for us on a monthly basis, giving advice on everything and like keeping up to date with all the kind of trends in CV and interviews and, and social media, because it all changes. It's definitely changed since I last applied for a job <laughs> quite a lot. So it's always good to, to hear from Emma what the latest advice is. Excellent. And we'll, we'll be back to talk more about some other stuff after that. Hi, Emma. Welcome to Mum's Dad's Work. Very nice to have you. Thanks for having me. So we're talking CVs today. So so tell me a little bit about sort of how you started your business and, and what you what have you seen? It's a bit of a big question, I suppose, to start, but the kind of the big macro changes that you've seen in terms of CVs over the kind of past three or four years. Yeah, so I would say it has been continually evolving, as you probably know. So I started the CV Guru in July 2017, when my youngest daughter was six months old. I did it to probably provide myself with the flexibility that I needed to have having two young children. And don't be wrong, working as a business owner, you do work a lot of hours, but at least I can be 
I can choose when those are so I can work around my children. So that's probably the main reason I started the CB business. I'm from a recruitment background and I had done CB writing for other organisations. So, you know, it was a sort of natural pivot for me and something I really enjoy. The main change I would probably see, because that's now been seven years on, I said you do have to really keep up to date with industry requirements. But you know the world that we live in, everybody... You know, once the way Amazon, I suppose, has maybe made us all think, you know, people want things the next day. They want to be able to see information very quickly. And I think that now goes the same for the CVs. So it once used to be one big document where we would, people would include, you know, almost everything that they used to have about their careers. But nowadays, everybody's not staying in the same job or the same couple of jobs that they've always had. And they might have had different jobs so it's really important to just showcase the information the employer wants to see and not dilute it with everything else. Because if you're trying to give everything you've ever done, it can be quite hard and more challenging for the recruiter to find out what's relevant and what's not. So my main advice would be just to put what's relevant for that position down so you're not diluting that experience with everything else. We'll get into the weeds of that in, in a minute, if that's OK. <laughs> but um, but I, I suppose when I, I talk to young people and who are kind of going into their first job and, you know, I, I, it used to be when, when we started, when I as an old person started, it was, you know, a paper CV and I guess in turn a sort of a Word document. What's your kind of take on Word document versus digital digital CV and, and sort of, I suppose, being all digital rather than having this sort of traditional paper albeit in in word document form so i mean digital definitely has its place with lots of different positions such as maybe you know graphic designers video editing positions so it definitely does serve its purpose purpose for some industries but i would still say there's still a heavily reliance upon that word document we have an um, ats applicant tracking software to consider and word documents are still you know needed to get past all these systems so i would still say word documents definitely has its place however if you are probably in more of a creative industry then you will be expected to think a little bit more out the box emma what do you think is the for, for you when you're working with people what's the thing that people most ask you you know in, in terms of advice and what is the thing that they're most likely to kind of find difficult so I think there's still a lot of knowledge for people to gain about applicant tracking software and I think there's a lot of I suppose unnecessary worry about ATS as well because people have heard they maybe just hear little bits of information they think oh my goodness, a computer's going to get me, you know, not even let my CV be screened or it's not in the right format or I've not included the right keywords. Of course, it is important, but it's definitely not the only thing that you need to be worried about. And another common question I would say, which is a bit of an easier one to address is how long should my CV be? How many pages should it be is a, is a key question as well. Do you get asked a lot? I mean, we get asked a lot in working mums and stuff is about career gaps. You know, that it's the perennial question, you know, where how do I uh, how do I do it on my CV? How do I mention should I mention it? Should I not mention it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think do not shy away from a career gap. There's no point in some people think, oh, I need to maybe manipulate some of the information or play about with dates or try and hide it a little bit. I, you know, I do believe employers are far more open now about career gaps and understand whether people have taken time out, whether it be raising children, you know, maybe help caring for somebody, or perhaps they've even just taken a career gap and gone traveling for a year or two as well. It's far more common, but I don't think people should worry about hiding away. You don't need to go into a massive description about it, but acknowledge those gaps. And another way to combat it in your CV would be to have a section of maybe perhaps you finished up as a project manager, but you might be looking to go back into perhaps PA work that you've done previously. You can, you don't have to have your CV in a chronological order. You can showcase relevant work experience up front. So when the employer again is looking at your CV, they can see straight away on the first page the information that they need to see and the experience you have. 
back in the day, you just, as you say, do a chronological CV and just have, you know, list all the things that you've done in your education and everything. But then there was a phase where lots of, you know, that where there's a little paragraph at the top, which is kind of like a, a sales pitch. <laughs> yes. Is, is that still, is that still in? Yeah, absolutely. So you would have your profile up at the top, which would explain your background, your skills and experience, just the summary. And perhaps if you are changing career or you maybe have been, um, you know, been um, prioritising other demands, then you would just explain that now actively seeking work due to, you know, children moving on into school or whatever the reason might be. You would have a key skills section and then you would move on to your career summary, which you can showcase in a chronological order or you could have relevant career summary. And that would be those work experiences that are more relevant to what you're applying for. You mentioned uh, ATS, and that's something that a lot of people get a little bit confused by. How do you stop yourself being kicked out <laughs> of the process before you've even begun? You know, you're fantastic, you're amazing, but there is this sort of this thing that is is tracking you essentially and deciding and breaking it down from, from right at the beginning. So how do you kind of get around some of that stuff right at the start? So firstly, it's really important that you upload your CV in a Word format because that will help information be uploaded to the recruiter software if it's in a pdf document you can run the risk of it all not being pulled off correctly so that's a really quick easy you know thing to implement another part would be really study that job advert so you could be in hr for example but different companies use different language so look at that job advert and have a look at the essential skills or the key responsibilities and make sure that you've almost mapped them across to your cv of course not word for word but that key skill section in your professional profile, particularly in your CV, should be slightly adapted to each position that you apply for. So you're mirroring the language because when the recruiter at the other side, after the closing date, they will go into that database and start typing in keywords of that job advert. And if your CV has those keywords, you will become top of their search results, which is a really good way to get past it. But if you are sending off that, generic CV that you know you're trying to get to be applicable to every single HR job out there it's maybe not going to be it's not going to get the desired results so it's always quality over quantity I think when you're applying for work. If you're trying to change as you mentioned before if you're trying to change sector and you don't have you know you can't put in those keywords because you haven't done those things <laughs> how do you how do you get past the ATS systems in that respect do you just try a map at the top yeah so you could even say something like in the professional profile something like passionate about understanding the you know and then again mention those key skills or the desire so passionate about understanding you know and as I said whatever those key skills are map them in so you're not saying you've got them but you are keen to understand them or you have knowledge of you might not again have that practical experience but still talk about it because you need to show that you are relevant and you have got the capabilities of understanding what that role does. Great, great. That's interesting. I particularly with going back for, I think when I started out working, it was one page for a CV, then it went to two pages. Then I think it went up to possibly three and now it's back to one, I think, or or is it not? Like, are you always, are you a one, a oneer? No, I would say two. <laughs> two. Okay. I think unless you're a graduate, I think it's near impossible, unless you've been in the same job for a very long period of time, to keep your CV to one page, to give that level of detail that's required, I think, two pages is the optimum length. Those maybe who've worked in lots of different contracting positions or very senior um, level individuals that have maybe had non-exec careers as well, that's maybe when you would extend your CV into three pages. But one page, yes, for graduates and maybe school leavers and things. But as I said, two pages tends to be the optimum length. How far do you go back? Um, <laughs> you know, some people put their GCSEs on there. Like, <laughs> how far do you go back educationally? Yeah, so it's now recommended due to age discrimination, keep the dates off your, if your education so that that's not there. So there's no need if you maybe did your degree maybe 15, 20 years ago to have the date there, the degree's enough. 
if you have something that supersedes your education, so if you only have um, GCSEs, then absolutely keep them on there. But if you've now done A-levels and then after that a degree or maybe a project management qualification or something like that, you can lose the earlier qualifications because your most recent ones and more, I suppose, higher level ones supersede you know, the, the school qualifications. Also, the O levels, if you've done O levels, that kind of dates you as well. Well, exactly. <laughs> and I would recommend as well, and unless it's relevant and you are changing career, which can be definitely the case, but if you are able to have your CV in a chronological order and perhaps your most recent experience is, I suppose, more relevant to what you're applying for, then I would only really tend to go back 15 to 20 years max. And again, to avoid the age discrimination or unconscious bias, then you, you can, as I said, you're kind of placing everybody around the age of 40, I suppose, roughly, if you're doing a CV that's only dating back 15 to 20 years. And so an ATS doesn't sort of, it, that's not tracking that kind of that kind of information. It's not looking at dates for, I don't know, if you put your birth date in there or something like that, it's not looking at that kind of stuff, or is it? No, it, ATS won't look, it won't be biased because it's, I suppose, told not to. But <laughs> um, it's, it might, though, do things such as sometimes do adverts, it'll say must have so many years experience and such and such. It will be able to assess that as well. So you do have to make those considerations when you're, looking at your cv but again what 15 do you think... to 20 years should be substantial enough <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you think are the biggest then mistakes that people make what are the biggest glaring obvious mistakes that people make when when you see your when you see people's cvs i think what i still think people think they need to include absolutely everything because they're trying to give themselves the best possible chance so they'll say oh and i did this and i'm responsible for this and that and this and of course it is impressive, but again, they're diluting that relevant experience and then it makes it more confusing for the reader to understand, well, what do they do more of? Are they as relevant to me as maybe someone else who looks like they almost specialise in that area compared to this person who's doing you know, a wide range of things? So it's just to be conscious that you might need a couple of variations of your CV, but including everything sometimes can go against you because you really are diluting that really specific information that the reader needs to see. With with things like ChatGPT, which obviously is just in the last few months, I mean, is would you recommend against using ChatGPT for cover letters and CVs and things? Because I guess it's the same kind of thing that it will come with quite a generic um, type of style. Of yes, thing. yeah. I mean, as I said, we personally would recommend against using the likes of chat GPT, just GPT, because, again, you will get quite generic results. Of course, those people that can maybe afford to use, you know, a professional writer or maybe doesn't doesn't have anyone to use, have as a second eye to look at their documents, it can be a good starting point. But the thing I would always have to point out is don't just use that alone make sure that you are personalizing it and you're adding in all that specific information because it can be quite obvious if it is looking very general it really should be specific to to you and your experience so if you do want to use it definitely you could use it as a starting point but I wouldn't just be copying and pasting it right into your you know applications whether it's cover letters or CVs. You're going to be seeing that a lot, I think, aren't you? That kind I of thing where so. people just use it. Yeah, and you're <laughs> um, seeing as well, you're hearing about university students using it for essays and things like that as well. So it definitely, I think there's going to be a lot more chat about it going forward. Uh, well, I suppose one of the things, I mean, I've always been uh, uh, hopeless with CV, uh, making my own CV. I, I suppose one of the things that's always I've struggled with is this kind of idea of it being a list versus it being uh it sounds slightly cheesy but a story so sort of the story of me versus a list of things w where do you kind of stand on that side of it in terms of the sort of eloquence I suppose you need to kind of include in the detail or is it literally just bah, 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 you know kind of almost bullet pointy is better yeah so bullet points is definitely better it's easier for people to read and navigate around the document for what they require but what I suppose is really important is you don't want it just to be a list of job responsibilities. A good recruiter and the ATS will be able to hazard a reasonable guess as to what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. What's really important is to 
have a really good think about those key achievements. And it can be really tricky. I recently worked with somebody who had been out, um, she was bringing up um, her children for the last five years, fantastic fundraiser, and I'd asked her, what are your key achievements? And she said, oh my goodness, I wish I'd thought or I knew to write these down as I was going along, you know, throughout my career. So if you can remember, or you perhaps are lucky enough that you have maybe kept personal, you know, development reviews or appraisals and things, have a look back and get some facts and figures down there, because that's what's going to stand you out from other applicants, because responsibilities will be the same for different, maybe if it was a HR administrator, but again, what have you done differently? Have you enhanced the efficiency of the process? Are you getting visa applications, timings down? Um, have you, as I said, made sure you've had 100% compliance during an audit? Things like that. That's a little bit different than just that generic list. There's there's been talk um, from some quarters. I'm sure you've seen, like you know, that the CV is dead. You know, big big pronouncements <laughs> about this kind of thing. And some companies are are saying that they're not using them I guess they must be using some other way of sifting applications what do you think of that that kind of movement yeah so I think it's a tricky one because I suppose again it depends what type of positions you are applying for I've seen that myself where people will just send their experience and their names in taken away where they live the company names as well either have also been taken away because people maybe have, for example, with the big accountancy companies or big law companies, they need to come from the top, you know, like for accountancy, it's the top four. And they can say people can have unconscious bias towards, you know, accountancy companies that aren't within the big four, so therefore discriminate against the candidate. So I think it is definitely a movement that does need to perhaps come into existence so there is less unconscious bias as well but I think it'd be quite difficult to get away with applying for a job, a job without showcasing your experience in some form of a document video or application form so I don't think it's dead but I do think it will evolve again. Mm. Just on, on a you know obviously we're working dads working mums and that kind of thing we're talking about flexible working and, and that sort of thing is that something that should be included you know we, we're talking about legislation possibly that you gave to day one flexible working opportunities and things like that is that something to include in a cv that you would expect that or is that something to wait until um interview for again i think you have that unfortunately the unconscious bias again that we've been talking about i would wait to bring it up in the interview just as you know it's not the norm now to be including marital status and um, sexual orientation date of birth it probably again is one of those things of course if they're advertising it then absolutely great but at, the, at that point I think it's worth getting to the interview then they can see how fantastic you are and then you can start um, negotiating all of that. You mentioned video CVs, that was one of the things, and I know that quite a lot of people are now doing video interviews for jobs if they're sort of more remote. What's your advice? Is there anything particular that you should bear in mind when you're doing a, a video interview as opposed to a, an in-person one? So I think probably the biggest challenge with video interviews is firstly make sure your text working and you don't have anything, you know, deliveries coming during your time of your interviews or you know anything like that but also I suppose that aside of course making sure the text on point but making sure that you're making that effort to build the I suppose the rapport's a little bit harder you don't get that handshake the eye contact's a bit difficult as well because it's really awkward to look at the camera and not the person on the, the screen. So you do have to make more of an effort with your body language and your rapport, I would say, on video compared to that in-person meet, I suppose. So I'd say that's where, of course, your questions and your answers would be absolutely the same, but it's I'd say it's the body language and the rapport that you've got to work that little bit harder at over in a video call. A video CVs, uh, you know, is that something that you think works or do you think that is a, a viable alternative moving forward? 
So I think, I don't think you can have just a video CV. So for example, at the CV Guru, our recruitment process is a CV and we ask people to accompany it with a two minute video to present themselves why they wish to work for the CV Guru. So I think at the moment it's very much used as an accompaniment rather than that alone. But as I said, I do think it does have its advantages, the videos, because sometimes perhaps maybe the CV is not telling the full story or people are struggling to get their point across and you can you can look at a video and think actually I really like their you know attitude the way they come across their energy I'm absolutely going to to spend some time and interview them so I think it's a really good idea to have videos as part of the recruitment process but of course there's going to be I suppose some personality types and some types of roles that just would be not comfortable with that element at all. So I suppose it depends on the the job. I think we're wrapping up. Uh, uh, do you do you want to take our last question, Mandy? While we have Emma here. Oh well, I was going to I was going to ask about cover letters. Uh, that's the other big one, isn't it? I mean, uh, Ben mentioned about the storytelling in the in the CV and the bullet points and stuff. I guess the cover letter is where you can kind of tell a little bit of a story, even if you have to keep it quite brief. <laughs> no, absolutely. I think the cover letter is a really good point of the, the CV again will be used, like you said, for the applicant tracking software, but the cover letter is that opportunity to really, really explain why you want to um, move career or perhaps that you, you know, there's maybe a different job opportunity or you have been um, out of work for whatever reason, you can go into that little bit more of an explanation and display your passion a bit more about why you are looking to apply for that particular company. So a lot of people think, oh, a cover letter really read. I think they are. I think it goes to show that you are going above and beyond. You're spending that time to research the company. And people, you know, everyone, the, a lot more people are recruiting on skill, of course, but also values led as well. So if they can see that you that cover letter is aligned to the company values as well, then you are going to make yourself more of an attractive candidate and encourage the, the interview better. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Emma. That was, that was really good to talk to you, Emma. It was really good advice. Thank well, you. thanks for having me on. Well, Emma, fascinating as always. Really, really useful. I'm, I don't know about you. I'm going to go away and, and rewrite my CV, Mandy. <laughs> I hope you're not leaving. <laughs> no, 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 just for the, I just like, I just, it's for the fun of it. Like Emma made it sound so fun. <laughs> yes, it's a, it's basically storytelling, isn't it? It's, yeah. it's what we do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But to finish up this week, it's, yeah, a, a kind of big moment for, for working mums particularly because the, the, the annual survey has come out. So tell us a little bit about um, what's been going on with that and, and what you uncovered this year. Yeah, I mean, we've been doing the annual survey for many, many years, and we do change the questions according to what's been going on in the world, but we also have some of the questions that are quite similar, so it's interesting to compare um, over the years how things have progressed, particularly on things like flex flexible working, which is very interesting post-COVID. But the, the main focus at the moment is on cost of living crisis, obviously, and debt in particular and you know the survey showed that I think it was over over half of of uh, mums are in debt and often in quite a lot of debt one in ten over twenty thousand pounds and that's excluding mortgage and student loan and about half of them it's personal debt rather than household debt so quite a big issue and then we're looking at what what they're doing to kind of counter that uh, if, if they can and a lot of them are taking on side hustles or trying to increase their hours but but many of them can't actually increase their hours because then there's childcare costs involved with that and it's it's just you know kind of stuck in a trap and uh yeah so that's that's basically the survey covers I mean there's like 70 different questions that we asked in the survey so it's it covers all sorts of different survey. things it's a huge thing yes it's massive uh, and we'll be looking at different things over time and we can then we can sort of you know filter it for you know different types of family structures and and all of that kind of stuff so it's really interesting yeah I mean that that I think there was a piece actually in the Guardian last week about someone went to Finland I think to kind of like investigate what it's like to be a child in Finland or what it's like to be a parent and it really was an amazing kind of eye-opening thing about how much you know state uh, support there is and that kind of thing I mean it's you know I, I've always kind of hated the word side hustle because yes. it suggests that like your first job isn't enough you know it's like if it's a hobby or whatever then fine but like or you're doing two jobs 
but the side hustle thing i don't know it's the phraseology makes sound yeah it's like really fun and cool even though often it's that yes like, it's a hard just slog. doing it to pay the blooming bills you know Yes, yes. And a lot, I, I guess it's to cover side hustle is not, it's, it's often not a kind of regular employed job. I yeah. mean, it might be a, a regular employed job, but it's not, it, it's um, often sort of setting up something on the side, uh, setting up a business. Um, sometimes, I mean, the thing is that it's quite complicated, the kind of reasoning and stuff. And a lot of the things, a lot of the women that I've been speaking to, they were, they'd already taken a kind of downgrade in their pay when they had children. So they've moved to more flexible jobs that might be more local or, or, or or, um, more flexible and they've taken a pay cut and then the cost of living crisis has hit them and they've had to sort of increase what they do and the way of doing that is sometimes to kind of have an aggregate of different sort of jobs or uh, self-employed things which you end up a lot of them I'm talking to are sort of working 45 hours 50 hours plus weeks but they're working around their children and there's they're kind of trying to balance also you know they want to be around for their children and also childcare costs against needing the money so yeah. it's it's a difficult uh, balance and it's, and, and it's you know i think it's 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 weird for, obviously i'm the kind of working dad side of the of, of the thing but you know this it, it's not just a mum's issue i think this is what's no. you know it's the working mum survey of course yeah but it's you know all of this stuff is how the how the the other parent fits into that obviously not just a dad could be another mum but like um how the other parent fits into that how the grandparent and that support network fits into all of that and you know whether that side hustle is actually enough to or you know that second job is enough to be worth this so much money that childcare costs you know that there's enough money coming in to actually pay for that for it to be worth doing the, the job in the first place so Yes, and also whether the child there's accessible childcare. I mean, if the yeah. childcare is available, so so that's another issue. Yeah, and I, I definitely it's definitely a thing for both mums and dads, and um, you know, but but what I'm seeing is is still quite the same kind of structures where the dad will take on more hours, the dad's working full time, the mum's working sort of maybe flexible more flexibly more locally more lower paid to taking a you know that career hit it's, it's it's still the case that's still the case and I think that in those kind of that structure what you're seeing is is it exaggerating those divides so the dads are having to work more hours or take on more things and not seeing the kids on everything and the mums are working more hours as well but they're working around the children so they're yeah it's uh yeah it's, it's crazy and of course post covid when dad some a lot of other you know a lot of second carers dads have been used to actually being abroad more in the in the child care and actually being part of their families a little bit more than they might have been in the in the past and suddenly it's going back and the, the kind of you know the, the the scales are going really far the other way so I mean it'll be interesting how that all plays out but yeah I mean um, again with, with all that sort of stuff all the survey stuff where well, it's all over it, it was all over the press last week and you can check all it all, all out on on the working mums website and all over our pages and stuff so that's it for this for our, uh, our welcome back mum dad's work and the second season has begun Mandy are you excited uh yes i'm very excited <laughs> i'm always excited <laughs> good, good well thanks so much for joining us and uh, yeah we'll be back in a couple of weeks time we cut these are coming out fortnightly back in a couple of weeks time with loads more practical advice loads more in uh, whatever's in the news but hopefully this this has been a little bit helpful and and we'll keep on doing that as we as we go forward Yes, next time I think it's flexible working that we're, we're talking about and all the changes in the legislation that are coming up and also this whole kind of issue around people being asked to go back into the office more and that kind of thing, which is a huge issue for people. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much. Nice to see you, Mandy. Yes, you too. Have a good week. <laughs> you too. Bye. Bye.